Convergence encounters Jesus and transforms cities with his power and with his love. And, and that's what we're about. And I want to talk this morning about enlarging the table. Uh, we have been in a series. We pretty much most every message for the last several months has been about the table. And in uh, this morning, I, I, I've just been feeling this call for a while that the Lord is calling us not only to the table, but to enlarge the table. And so I want to look at a story um, in the Old Covenant. And, and don't you love the fact that we have such a good, good father, even as we were just singing, you're perfect in all of your ways. You know, I, I was up here worshiping and I was like, Lord, you know, what, what do you want me to bring to worship you? And he was having me bring, you know, not my awesome things, but he's such a big God that he wanted my lack. So I was bringing him my lack. I was bringing to you like, Lord, here's where I don't know what to do. Here's where I'm in debt. Here's where I lack direction right now. And you, that's what he wanted. Like, isn't that amazing that God is such a perfect father that we don't have to get our act together to come to worship him. That he actually wants your not together so that he can be your together. And there's always going to be an element of our life while we're here on this earth that's the not together. And he wants the strength and he wants the weakness. He is a perfect father. You know, if he wasn't a perfect father, we'd have to be getting our act together and coming and acting like we have. Every one of us here has it all together and we're bringing this perfection to God and everything is going to be perfect in this service. Every note is going to be perfect and everything you do this week is going to be perfect but life is not that way. And I love that. We, you know, we can learn to love the fact that we live with a perfect father and we come to him in our need. We come to him in our grief. We come to him in our pain. We come to him in our joy. We come in our strength. He's a good, good father. And we're invited to the table just like we are. It's not a table of, of get your act together and then come. And I'm, I'm so grateful for that today. So we're going to look at a story today uh, from the Old Covenant. And uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of background here. So Jonathan, now we know, we know that David was anointed to be king and then after David was anointed to be king, he just went straight to the palace and everything was wonderful, right? No, it was quite a journey. And, and so Saul, who was king, who is Jonathan's dad, his father, is out, is out to kill David. He's threatened by David. He's threatened by what David carries. And isn't it a good thing, too, that we can be just secure in who we are? And if I'm secure in who I am, I can be secure in who you are. And I can bless what you do, what you do better than me. So Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. So they had a very, very special friendship. And it says in 1 Samuel 18, 4, that Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him, and he gave it to David with his armor, including his sword and his bow and his belt. Now, now this was a huge thing. This isn't just like, hey, I'm just going to uh, give you a shirt or something. This had huge significance in the culture and in the place that Jonathan occupied as son of the king for him to do that. It's like, David, I am honoring you with this position and with this place. And so David, after this, it says David went out and wherever Saul sent him and he prospered. And Saul set him over the men of war and it was pleasing in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. So, so David is growing in favor and Saul is is like up and down. One moment he's trying to kill David, and the next moment he's like, you know, be over these servants. So 1 Samuel 20, 34, Saul has really come against David, and it says, Jonathan arose from the table, 
in fierce anger and did not eat food on the second day of the new moon, for he was grieved over David because his father had dishonored him. So Jonathan has honored David, has given him the robe. Saul continues to dishonor David. In the midst of the dishonor that Saul is pouring out on him, what does David do back to Saul? He actually honors. He even had opportunities to kill Saul and, and did not do it. And so Saul dishonors David. Jonathan, Saul's son, honors David. And we're going to look at a story today, 22 years later, where David honors Jonathan's son, Mephibosheth. Can you say Mephibosheth? Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth. See, we don't have to do things perfectly around here. Somebody who knows Hebrew is probably already just like, no, no, you did not. You said that in Texan, not Hebrew. <laughs> Sorry. Forgive me. So 2 Samuel 9, verse 1. David said, is there anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? So one day a king who could do anything he wanted to do chose to look for someone to show kindness to. I, I myself, I look at this as one of the high points of, of David's kingship. <laughs> this moment where he woke up, he could, have, he could have built another building, he could have gone out and conquered another nation. But he woke up and he said, you know, I want to do something kind. I remember that Jonathan honored me. He gave me a road. Robe, I wonder if there's anyone out there that is still related to Jonathan that I could show kindness to them. And this word kindness is an amazing word in the Hebrew language. It's kind of, it's, it's many times translated loving kindness. And it contains the mercy, kindness, and loyalty, and faithfulness all crammed into one word. So it's one of those words, it's like our, what we, when you just read in English, it's like it doesn't quite, quite do it, do it justice. And, and what I want to, where I feel like the Lord wants to take us today is that we can buy bigger tables, but it won't mean anything if something doesn't happen in the table of our hearts. And I feel this morning there's a grace from the Lord that he is enlarging the table of our hearts, that there's new places of kindness that he wants to activate in us so that we can be ready to expand the table in the natural, so that we can be ready for the growth, that the table of our hearts would be enlarged. You know, Paul said as he was preparing to come to Corinth, he said, look, you know, I can come to you and I can be there, but if you don't make room for me in your heart, it's not going to matter even that I came to you. And there's a harvest that God has for us that we're entering into, I believe, the first stages of. But I believe there's so much more that God wants to enlarge each of our hearts so that our hearts are ready with kindness for those that are about to come to the table. So 2 Samuel 9, verse 3. And the king said, Is there not anyone in the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God. And Ziba said to the king, there is still a son of Jonathan who is crippled in both feet. So basically David is saying, God has lavished his kindness on me and I can't hide it. I must give it away. I have experienced something that I will not hold to myself but I will let others see it. I won't hide it. I won't hide the love that I've experienced from my perfect father. I will let it be revealed. So verse 4, the king said to him, where is he? And Ziba said to the king, behold, he is in the house of Machir in the son of Amiel in Lodabar. Say Lodabar. Lodabar. Say it in Texan. Lodabar. All right, that's good. So Lodabar means pastureless. It, it's a place, it really symbolized the name, a place of lack. 
not land that was good that you could pasture on. And so Mephibosheth was the son of Jonathan, who's the son of the king, but he's had to flee because of what ha- probably when, when Saul and Jonathan died, he was probably taken, and he ends up in Lodabar. And actually, Mephibosheth actually became crippled that day as they were fleeing. It tells, tells the story of how, how he fell and was, was crippled at that time. And so he has been in this pastureless place called Lodabar. And I don't think, I don't think this is what David was probably expecting. I think he was probably expecting someone who was more higher and, and more recognized in society. And yet the harvest was Mephibosheth who was crippled in both of his feet. And back then there was in the culture, many times there was a devaluing of those who, ha- who had handicaps. And so he's in, he's in low Debar, He's crippled. I don't think, I don't know that this is what David was expecting. And you know, our harvest is not going to be people that look just like you. It's not going to be people who look just like us. It's not going to be people who grew up just like you grew up. And, and we've got to be ready in our hearts. You know, as I read the book of Acts, the book of Acts is the Holy Spirit keeps stretching them beyond their box. You know, so, so they have Pentecost, and that's pretty awesome. And then all of a sudden God says, yeah, but you know what? Samaritans also get Pentecost. And Samaritans were the one they really didn't like. And there were years and years of reasons that go back of why they didn't really like each other. But the Holy Spirit didn't seem to care about that. And the Holy Spirit loves to go beyond what you think is the border and where you're comfortable and where I'm comfortable. And we just live with that. I mean, one of the questions I started asking the Lord a long time ago as a leader in a church like this, trying to lead a church like this, was, Lord, I'm uncomfortable with that. And one day he's like, well, ask me if I'm uncomfortable with it. (laughs) And I learned that there's a lot of things I'm uncomfortable with that he's not uncomfortable with it. I'm like, Lord, that's really kind of weird right now. And, you know, I'm sort of, you know, I feel like I have some responsibility here. How do you feel about that? And I've learned to ask him. And it it takes, you got to work pretty hard to make him uncomfortable, you know. (laughs) <laughs> so there are going to be people come at the table who so need what we were drowning in the love of God this morning. There's people all around here. There's people in this trailer park who have never once felt the love of God that I drowned in this morning. There's people right next door to you, right across the street who have never, ever tasted the love of a perfect father that is burning inside of you and is going to burn more in you and is going to burn through you to touch and change their lives. I wanted even just to give you a way that we enlarged our table as our kids were growing up. Um, We didn't have an app for this, but we had these prayer cards. It was called Operation World, and of course now there's an app for that. <clears throat> There's an app for everything. But we had, we had these prayer cards, and, and we'd bring it out at the table. We'd pray, and we'd pull out a nation, and we'd read, like today's is Chechia. And, and on the app, it tells you about the nation, where they are spiritually, and, and it gives you statistics about, about the nation. Um, and you can, you can read about how things are going spiritually. Now you can even click and say, I am praying. You know, it's got that join in element that our world is so about today. And, uh, that was a way we enlarged our table and it impacted, it impacted our kids. We let, we let the nations into our dinner time in our, in our prayer. And so I, Parents, I want to encourage you to check this out, and it it could be a way of of enlarging your table. 
So a king chose to honor someone society would not have chosen to honor. Verse 6. You there? Testing. Are you there? All right, okay. And Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face and prostrated himself. And David said, Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth said, here is your servant. Now, Mephibosheth means dispeller of shame. (laughs) Now, isn't that interesting? What does Mephibosheth have on him in the moment? He has shame on him. And you know, many times the thing that you battle the most is for a reason. It's because you're called to live above it. But you're going to come through it. And so here's Mephibosheth, whose name means dispeller of shame, but yet he's living in shame. But yet he's about to be free from that shame. But he's going to know what it was like to live not free from shame. Verse 7, and David said to him, do not fear. Say, do not fear. Do not fear. fear." You know, that that phrase is found throughout Scripture, and it's not just a nice, cute phrase. It's really important that we carry and release the perfect love of God that breaks off fear. Because there are places that people cannot go There are things they cannot receive until we say to them, hey, you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to listen to that voice of fear. And there are those in our society who rather than free us from fear, they want to capitalize on fear so that they can control. And we come in the opposite spirit. I do not come to control. I do not come to release fear. But I come as one who carries the perfect love of God that casts out all fear. All fear. We have been given authority over fear. And it is a big deal. And when angels come and they say things like that, well, don't be, don't be afraid again. It's not just that that's nice. No, it is that there was something that needed to happen that wouldn't have happened if the fear wasn't do notted <laughs> off. <laughs> do not fear. Don't be afraid. And people are watching us in the midst of a world that is paralyzed with fear in ways I've you know <laughs> never seen in my whole life. We get to live lives confident. Secure in the love of God. We bring people from a table of fear to a table of love. A table of perfect love, perfect acceptance. The table of a perfect father. A table where you can come just like you are and open your heart without fear. A table where people are going to find themselves sharing more than they really wanted even to share when they first came to that table. Because the love of God is going to break open their hearts. So David said to him, do not fear, for I will surely show kindness to you for the sake of your father, Jonathan. And I will restore to you all the land of your grandfather, Saul, and you shall eat at my table regularly. So we bring people to a table of kindness. And I want to encourage us today that kindness is inside of you. And I, I, love, I love the new covenant that we live in. You know, if I was preaching to you and you're the old covenant, here, I would be saying to you, be more kind. Try harder to be kind. Work at it. Be kind and, you know, but somebody's inside of you (laughs) in this new covenant. (laughs) And so what I want to come and tell you today is that kindness is exploding inside of you 
and it really wants to get out of you too. Okay? <laughs> don't hide it. Don't hold it back. Let it flow through you. And this kindness that's in you, like all the fruit of the Spirit, are made for times when the opposite is what your flesh wants to do. But I want to tell you, Holy Spirit is more powerful than your flesh. <laughs> and so there's kindness exploding inside of you, so much so that when someone is unkind to you, you don't even just have to go to neutral. You actually go into, I can be kind back to you when you are unkind to me. When someone responds to me unkindly or you on social media, we don't have to fire back in that spirit of unkindness. I get to fire back kindness at you. Because someone is inside of me and kindness is bursting through me. One of my favorite remembrances of my dad. <clears throat> One day we were at we were at a Houston Astros game. Uh, there were a lot of, you know, my dad would go preach and people would open up and do things for us. It was it was a wonderful experience. And so we're on the first baseline. Of, of the Houston Astros and foul balls coming. I'm watching it. I actually kind of, you know, it's one of those things that's locked in my mind in slow motion. You know, here comes the ball. And, you know, I, I've, me and my brother, we, we, you know, we loved baseball. We, we played all kinds of little league and, and everybody wants a ball. You know, you want the, that's a real, you know, a major league baseball. Come on. And, and so the ball's coming, and, and, and it's slow motion. I'm watching, and I'm like, oh, it's coming to me. And it drifts over more towards my dad, and it's coming right at my dad. And this lady is right here, and she reaches over and pushes in front of my dad and catches the ball. Like, I mean, like out of his hands, basically. And I'm sitting, my brother and I, we're sitting there going, Whoa, the ball came. My dad, my dad caught the ball. And then we're like, this lady stole the ball, the Major League Baseball out of my dad's hands. It was like the worst criminal act I'd ever seen at that age. <laughs> my dad, now, here's the thing. The ball was in my dad's hand. Like, she... Like, really, she grabbed it. So my dad's holding the ball. And the woman says, I caught the ball. You know what my dad did? He reached over and said, you can have it. And he calmly gave the woman the ball with no argument. My brother and I are sitting there going, what? <laughs> like, my brain is trying to compute this, you know. I think I was about 12 at the time. And that memory is stuck in my mind as one of my favorite memories, though. Because what my dad did in that moment was so much like Jesus. And I already had my time to catch a major league ball. Not only not an Astros ball, but a Texas Rangers ball. Yeah. Who needs an Astros ball? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah! <laughs> My dad stepped into a place of kindness at that time that I didn't hardly even know how to process it in the moment. But to this day, it's one of my favorite memories. You know, I think of another example of kindness that really rocked, rocked my world was when Marcy was getting ready to go to Mozambique one day. And she said, hey, guys, I want, you to, I want you to bring your shoes to the altar and leave them here. I'm going to take them to Mozambique. And uh, I'm sitting down here going, I'm calculating. Lots of shoes, boxes, lots of, like, it's not easy to get to 
Pimba, Mozambique. And getting shoes to Pimba, Mozambique costs a lot. I'm thinking, you know, you could buy shoes, you know, like, you know, we can buy, let's see, let's go somewhere and, some, you know. But Marcy's like, no. And I've learned, how many husbands have learned, and we learn husbands and wives, like you just kind of, there's things you go with just because you've seen it work for your spouse a few times, even though you don't really kind of believe it yet. But you've seen it enough, you're like kind of afraid to get in the way. Okay? Well, that was me. I'm like, okay, you know, we're loading all these shoes in the car. And I'm, I'm like, <clears throat> keep a good attitude, keep a good attitude. Don't, don't, blow, don't blow this one, you know. And so I'm, we're loading them in the car. I'm, keep, I'm keeping a good attitude. And, and she hauls them all to Pimba, you know, like, you know, getting them, putting them on carts and all these different airports. And it, it, it's just a ton ton of work that she had to go through to get it there and she shows up in Pimba Mozambique and she's in a staff meeting and Heidi is saying hey we need we need prayer because this village we just treated the people's feet to remove these worms out of their feet but they will get the worms again quickly if they don't have shoes to put on their feet and we don't have shoes for their feet and Marcy had just walked into that meeting and said, shoes, <laughs> brought some shoes from Fort Worth, Texas. And people left here barefoot, you know, couldn't even go to the restaurant. People put in, I mean, they, this wasn't go bring your shoes you don't want. This was people left the shoes they wore on Sunday morning that they liked enough to wear to church and sent him over to Mozambique. And it was an act of kindness that literally saved lives. And to this day, Heidi Baker talks about it all over the world. Because a woman said, I want to show some kindness. We're just going to, I think God's saying we should take shoes to Mozambique. And she did, wanted to do something that crazy. And I love that. And I love that. I love that about my wife. And I just want to say, there's some radical kindness inside of you. There's more. There's more than you know. There's more than you see. And why wouldn't you be the kindest person that someone encounters this week? With Holy Spirit inside of you, why wouldn't I be the kindest person that you encounter? This week, we also bring people to a table of restoration. Things that have been stolen from Mephibosheth. And he didn't even know there was more for him. And there was more for him. And we get to bring people. We're going to see miracles of restoration at the table. And we're going to find ourselves even surprised at people that we're, we're at the table with. And God is going to give us authority to bless people at the table. The other day I was at a table and, and the Lord just spoke to me. He said, you know, I'm going to be bringing you to tables. And when I bring you to that table, you have authority. I'm like, really? It's, you know, you're not, it's not just this, an accident and that we're always there just to like, like there's something God's even going to release at times. And, and he said, I, I'm, going to, I'm going to bring you to the table and give you authority. But you know what authority is for? Authority is to bless. Paul says twice in 2 Corinthians, he says, the authority which the Lord has given to me, not to harm you, but to bless you. And so whatever authority you have in your work, as a parent, as a child of God, that authority is, is to release blessing. And I, I've been shocked by some of the tables that I've been at. I've, I've sat at tables where I was like, tried to not. Even, even recently, I was with, you know, a leader of two different ministries. And, 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 and I was sitting there like, I don't, I don't, need, I, I don't want to be there. They're like, no, you got to be at the table. So I got, I got to sit at the table and just learn and listen. One day I sat at the table. Um, well, 
I don't need to go to that one. We'll skip that. All right. It's a table of restoration. And he took Mephibosheth from Lodabar, pastureless, into the restoration of the land that his father owned. And we bring people into a table of inheritance. Inheritance happens at tables. Inheritance is released at tables. And so we're going to bring people who don't even know they have an inheritance, and they're going to find an inheritance in God. And people are going to find restoration of what their family name means and what their name means. And Mephibosheth was brought out of pastureless. He was brought out of a place of shame into a place where he could live his name as a dispeller of shame. And a man of great inheritance. So King David lifted Mephibosheth out of obscurity and desolation and restored his rightful place as a member of the royal court. And so Mephibosheth prostrated himself and said, what is your servant that you should regard a dead dog like me? So this is what, this is how Mephibosheth saw himself. In fact, he probably thought David was going to kill him. And so the king called Saul's servant Ziba and said to him, all that belonged to Saul and all his house I have given to your master's grandson. And you and your son and your servant shall cultivate land for him. And you shall bring in produce so that your master's grandson may have food. Nevertheless, Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, shall eat at my table regularly. David didn't have to go that far. He could have said, we're going, we're going to have a Mephibosheth table over here. He says, no, Mephibosheth's coming to my table. He enlarged his table. And Ziba said to the king, according to all that my lord king commands his servants, so your servant will do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table as one of the king's sons. We're bringing people to a table of family. And we got some brothers and sisters out there, guys, who haven't been brought in yet. That are part of the family. That are going to take on the family name. That are going to be sons of God like you're a son, a daughter of God. And I just want to remind us of the prophetic word that Heidi Baker spoke back in October last year. I just want to take us through this one more time because I feel it was such a key word. People come in that need fellowship and I see them coming in around tables and we didn't tell Heidi that we're shifting we were like in the process of beginning this process of shifting table groups I see see them coming in around tables I see round tables and speaking to people about tables and chairs I see people going to Costco and buying folding chairs the Lord says you're going to need them because people are coming into houses into living rooms I see such fellowship in homes and abundance of love and fellowship and depth of relationship in homes. Young people that have just been on the screen, on the screen, but their hearts are lonely, hurting, and broken. The Lord is going to welcome you into fellowship and family. And people that are feeling sad, the Lord is going to set free from that. And he's going to bless you with family, fellowship, and true depth of relationship and understanding safe places safe houses wounded warriors wounded missionaries wounded pastors wounded worshipers wounded ones coming into homes where there's food kindness love and the presence of god it is like a party place <laughs> yeah i think she even said festa in portuguese and uh, where the presence of god is so filling that space that people just step in Young people step in and they are healed. This is a family. We are family. All right. Maybe that maybe I wasn't supposed to receive that thought. I can do that. I did though. A house of sending, a place where people can come and be refreshed again. House is a hospital and there's a triage going on where people are being operated on even during worship. How many of you, you know, I hear this testimony a lot. How many of you, when you first came here, like you cried like the first several months, like you were here? Just raise your hand all across the room. I want you to look around this room. This is a place of healing, guys. That doesn't happen everywhere you go. 
What a gift that is from God. That people would come in the room and feel love and feel family and begin to open up and weep and begin a healing process with the Lord. Then they're going to know their sins. It's going to be a house of refreshing, a house of glory, and a house of praise. And she saw round tables. There were so many round tables that people have a seat at the table. And there's a Thanksgiving feast going on week after week after week. How many of you like to kind of extend and have Thanksgiving all year? <laughs> they come in and talk about what happened that week, coming in with testimony, which is like fruit that is being laid on the table. It is so glorious and the fruitfulness is beyond what we have ever understood. So, to end the story, in the Convergence version, King David sent Ziba to Costco to get more tables and chairs. And some of you literally need to get some tables and chairs. Andrew just went to Costco and even said, well, I'm just going to act on this. He went to Costco and bought, bought a chair. So one day a king washed the feet of his friends as they came to the table. And he washed even the feet of the one who would betray him. And one day a king went from a table to a cross so that all might come to the table. And one day this king's people extended their tables to make room for more in the family and to restore inheritance. And one day this king is having a feast and their place is reserved for many more at the table. Will you stand with me? We're going to take communion together. Jesus, we're so thankful that you came as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And as we sang today, the name that's above every name and all rule and power and authority and dominion, there is no other name but the name of Jesus. And you came and you knelt in the dirt. And you wash the feet of your disciples in kindness, in love. Demonstrating what true authority and true leadership is. And we thank you, Jesus, that you went from that table to the greatest act of kindness That could ever be that you are our perfect lamb. And Lord, that we get to trade our junk, our sin, our mess. And we don't just get a little ticket to heaven. Someday, Lord, we get a whole new life. We become righteous. Lord, I pray that you'd find us ready. I pray. I pray you'd enlarge our hearts. I pray you'd enlarge my heart, God. to include those that my flesh hasn't wanted to include. That when people have shame on them, that I won't agree with that shame and get under that shame, but that I will step in to something higher, something greater, something heavenly, something more real. Lord, would you enlarge our hearts in this moment? Would you expand our capacity? 
find the tables of our hearts ready. Lord, would you prepare us? Lord, no amount of money. We can't go to Costco and get our hearts fixed. We can't go to Costco and pay some money to get a heart for the neighbor that we don't care about anymore. But Lord, you, you are the one who can enlarge our hearts. And so we just welcome that working in our hearts today. If that's you, just say yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Just ask him right now and speak it out loud in whatever words is to enlarge your heart. Lord, enlarge my heart. Enlarge my heart. Enlarge the table of my heart, God. <sighs> Soften the places that have grown hard. That my heart would once again burn that we would wake up as a king one day woke up and said, who can I show kindness to today? Someone has been kind to me. Someone has shown kindness to me. So Jesus, thank you for that. Thank you for the harvest. Thank you for the table. cracker his body was broken for us and so when I say that I'm going to say that again his body was broken for us and the next time I say it when I say that I want you to break in that very moment, to symbolize that Jesus' body was truly broken for us. So I'm going to say it now. His body was broken. Broken. Jesus, we receive the fullness of your body broken for us, and we thank you for it. We thank you for every drop of your blood. And your blood, Lord, is so much bigger than this room. And you have purchased already men from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation who are called to be at the table with us for all eternity. We just, we take our place in that harvest, Lord. We take our place wherever that sends us in this region, wherever that sends us in our neighborhood, wherever that sends us, Lord, this week, wherever it sends us around the world, wherever it takes us in the heavenlies, whatever it means, God, we thank you for the sprinkled blood of the perfect Lamb of God, for the full harvest, the full harvest that you have appointed and that your blood is so much bigger. Your blood redeems, Lord, even someone in Lodabar. Lord, your, your blood redeems. Your blood redeems. Your blood redeems proud religious people. Your blood redeems people who are in perversion. Your blood redeems people who are stuck in pornography, people who are in sex trafficking. Your blood redeems. Your blood cries out and releases a better word. Your blood shifts the atmosphere of cities and nations. Your blood releases transformation and tables. 
Your blood triumphs. And we are not afraid. We are not afraid of anything that's out there, God, because of the power of your blood. The power of your love. And so, thank you, Jesus, for the blood of the new covenant. I want you just to put your hand on the shoulder of someone near you there. And I want you to bless the kindness that they carry. I bless the kindness of God that's in you. I bless the kindness of God to flow through you like never before. Your kindest days are still in your future. <laughs> I bless the kindness of Holy Spirit flowing through your life. I bless every place that kindness is going to take you. Every person that's going to be splashed with that kindness this week. Thank you for it, God.